So, um, hi everyone. Uh, I'm glad to be here. Uh, my name is Achia Eliasaf, and today I will present some joint work with Professor Gera, Gera Weiss, which is uh, who is also also here. Um, both of us from Ben Gurion University. So, uh, in this presentation, I will show you different ways that we use AI and software engineering for improving each other and how we use them both for improving uh, software quality. And at the core of this talk and all the research direction that I will uh, present is a modeling and a programming paradigm for developing reactive systems, which is called uh, behavioral programming or just you know, shortly uh, BP. And, and BP has two important principles or, or ideas. The first one is that uh, the model has to be executable. You need to be able to execute the model. And it also has to be modular. So uh, uh, each module or a piece of a software is aligned to a single aspect of behavior uh, of the system, usually a requirement. So specifically, uh, we have each requirement that is translated into a single scenario. And this scenario can specify what the system can do, what it should do, and what it should not do. And I'm emphasizing the last one that should not do because I'm going to talk about it uh, later on. Um, and given these scenarios that are aligned with the requirements, we have an execution engine that you see here that knows how to execute them in a, a cohesive manner such that all requirements are satisfied at any given time. And then we get a system that implements all the set requirements. And here's a spoiler alert. If, you if your uh, connection drops, um, so this is a kind of a takeaway for, for, for this lecture, that BP, I mean, uh, behavioral programming, is a great uh, modeling language that defines well the interaction or even the synergy between software engineering and AI. It helps in many AI tasks and vice versa. So um, we'll see that uh, in a minute. And to better understand what behavioral programming is, let's take a look at this example. It's, it's a very tall example, okay? So suppose we have a, a system with two taps, one for hot water and one for uh, cold water. And suppose that we have two similar requirements, one for each tap. And the requirement, say, the requirement says, when the system loads, uh, pour three units of cold or hot water. And, and on the left side, you see the implementation of these requirements. So as I said, there's a, a single uh, module uh, for each requirement. So for the cold requirement, we have a, an, a, this is a, an automata that represents the implementation. We have uh, different uh, languages, DSLs for, for implementing the, the paradigm. So here you just see a, an automata, but we, we have some code also for, for doing that, and, and you will see that uh, in a few slides from here. So when the system loads, so this one here, it uh, the, the, this B thread, this behavioral thread requests for cold water three times, and then it terminates. And on the uh, right side, you have the uh, the second B thread that requests for hot water three times. And and once we execute this system. Uh, we get several different possible executions. So th there's no relation between the request cold water and the request hot water. And therefore any of these possible, uh, any of these executions are possible. We can get cold, hot, hot, cold, hot, cold, hot, cold, hot, cold, and so on. And, and there are many more. And, and this is already different from imperative uh, languages that oblige us or oblige the programmer to specify the exact execution order which results in over-specification. So in behavioral programming, if the requirement does not specify the specific order, you don't say, you just you get any order. And, and now let's assume that we have a new requirement that two actions of the same type cannot happen in a row. So again, in, in regular uh, imperative languages, you would say, okay, so let's put an if statement somewhere in the code and say that we need to uh, to do first call and then hot and, and, and so on. But uh, in behavioral programming, we have a new requirement. So we have a new piece of code 
And this code says that we cannot, um, uh, when, when the system loads, we wait for cold water and, and while blocking hot water from happening and then wait for uh, cold, uh, hot water and, and blocking cold water for happening. And if we do that, the only possible execution is cold, hot, cold, hot, cold, hot, which is what we want. And now, how, how does it happen? So the secret is the, uh, the secret uh, ingredient is the um, execution engine. And the execution engine is, is quite simple. At any given moment, all the scenarios, okay, each of these scenarios, we have three scenarios in this case, they state what they request, or each scenario uh, states what it requests and uh, that will happen, or, and what it waits for uh, happening, but it does not request, and what it blocks from happening. So you see these statements on the left. Each, each yellow point is a statement. And, 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 and after uh, uh, passing these uh, statements, these scenarios uh, yield their execution and wait for new instructions. And now the execution engine takes all these statements, filters all requested and not blocked events or request events, and then uh, choose one of these events and finally advances all the threads that all the scenarios uh, that waited or uh, requested this, uh, this uh, selected event. Now, it may seem a little bit um, inefficient to keep asking everyone what to do at any given moment, but in fact, um, we have implemented using behavioral programming many uh, systems, including uh, real-time systems like uh, quad rotors and, and, and satellites and, and so on. So it, uh, we have a very uh, efficient implementation for that, with several implementations for that. Um, now, take a look at this uh, funnel that, down here. Um, it can, we, we can uh, use this, um, uh, funnel uh, to choose event. We, we need to use this funnel to choose an event each time, single event, and we can use it to choose randomly an event. But we can also use AI for, for selecting events. And we will see that um, again in a few slides. Here is another uh, toy example, though a bit more complex, uh, to help you understand the polygon. So you see here the code for tic tac toe. And on the left, uh, uh, you see the, the game, uh, above each behavioral thread, you have uh, the, the requirements, so a cell can be marked only once, and the behavioral thread just below implements this requirement. So this is just the name, do not mark a uh, cell twice, and this behavioral thread is in the context of a, of a cell. We have nine cells, so during uh, execution, we will have nine copies of this uh, behavioral thread, one for each cell. And, and the, the behavior is defined in the, in the body here. So we wait for X or an O in this cell, and then we block a, a, another marking in this cell, um, and, and so on. So these B threads define, a, let's say, correct behavior of the game. But the B threads do not define an optimal uh, player behavior. And for choosing the best move at each turn, we can either explicitly specify these behavioral threads. So I would call them strategy B threads uh, that, that define a strategy for, for tic-tac-toe. We can learn these B threads, or we can just use a smart funnel. For example, let's use a um, neural network to learn which action to choose at each time, at each uh, turn. Well, feel free to ask any question if you, if you have. Yeah, let me ask a question now that you yep. said I can ask. So uh, the, um, the the thing I'm trying to figure out, I don't know anything about behavior programming. So I'm coming from the point of view of people who have been building systems forever. And things like temporal logic combined with you know, traditional programming, some modelings like SysML, for example, have been doing a pretty good job from what I can tell. So the point here is, exactly what problem or what deficiency in the current system uh, engineering is behavior programming trying to address? So um, first, I think I, I'm answering this in, in a few slides from here, but, but I will answer it now. Um, the key difference between behavior programming and other um, modeling languages and you know, um, 
synthesis uh, languages and, and, and so on. So the key difference is uh, first you have uh, the ability to say what you, you what the system must not do. And the ability to say uh, um, anti-scenarios, to say what the system must not do, it um, dramatically reduces the number of words that you need to say to, to express things. So you can say, you can actually say um, all these different behavioral threats and they, they, they work together very well. And also there's no need for a translation. So uh, for example, we, we just write the behavioral threats exactly the same way we think about it, exactly the same way we think about requirements. So you have a new requirement, no problem. The requirement refines a different requirement. Just add a new behavioral threat that refines the other requirement. You can say what cannot happen. This is why you are able to refine behaviors and align your code to the uh, requirement to the way you think. So there's no need for translation or, 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 or uh, I don't know, uh, make some pre-processing for, for, for before you're writing. So this is introducing new constructs to specify what the system shall not do in a way which is easy to capture and hopefully easy to implement, right? Is that a, is, is that a way to think about it? Yeah. yeah. Okay, all right. Thank you. Um, okay, so now that you have a basic understanding of behavior programming, um, I wish to show you how it can be used uh, in the context of programming. So in front of you, you have two vehicles and one is smart and the other one is not. And the smart one is of course the horse. And, and, and some will tell if, if anyone recognizes. Um, on the right, only needs to tell uh, his horse in which direction and speed to go. And the horse will take care of not crashing into walls, bypassing obstacles and, and so on. Meaning that uh, some defines, defines a certain level of abstraction for the task. And the horse as a smart and intelligent uh, animal execute this uh, task while going into implementation details on the go, on the way. And the driver on the left, uh, on the other hand, uh, that has no uh, autonomous car yet, uh, must tell the car at any given moment what to do and, and how many degrees to turn the wheel and how to speed up and how to stop and how to bypass obstacles and so on. And the way we program today is like, uh, uh, is, is, is like the driver on the left, but we do want to program like the right side. So think about autonomous vehicle, maybe a percentage of, of its software specifies the operation that it can do, what it do or does and, and what it must not do. And, and, and this part of software of development creates a very large space of actions that the vehicle can do at any given moment. So for example, the, the car can simply cross lanes all the time, flash the car in front of it, turn on and off the air conditioner and, and so on. And, and in order for the vehicle to drive pleasantly, not endanger other people and save electricity and so on, we need to choose correctly what to do at any given moment. And these decisions are difficult and these are the essence of programming. And, and the idea here, is that if you take behavior programming for defining this core of behavior, and, and this is very agile and scalable, and, and, and we can um, um, change the model on the fly on, on, always because it, it's, it's uh, agile by its nature. Um, so uh, if, if you define the, the core of the program, the, the the do, do not, and, 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 and may do uh, scenarios using behavioral programming, then you can use uh, AI for uh, making the car, the, the, the program behave as you want, according to the specification. And, and what you get, you get, a, uh, you, you get a guarantee that the AI model will not operate in a way that contradicts the requ requirements. And we get a system that is both safe correct and optimized. And moreover, we will save a huge amount of, of, of time of, of programming because 99% probably of, of programming even more is about optim optimizing the, the, these requirements. 
Um, so here's an example for, for, uh, for this um, idea. And, and uh, Tom is actually here in, the, in, the, uh, in this talk. Uh, uh, it's, it's not a published paper and we, we still, uh, uh, we're still working on it. Um, so here you have this, the game of a soccer one and you have a, a walker over here that needs to move the boxes towards the, the targets, the red targets. And there are several rules. You cannot move uh, two boxes in a row and you cannot move a box into a wall and so on. And there's also one implicit, I would say, um, behavior or uh, you can call it also a liveness behavior. Um, and, and this behavior says that in order to win, you must not get into a deadlock. You must be able to keep moving the boxes until they reach the target. And uh, so in this uh, work, what we did, we defined this uh, liveness uh, uh, behavior or liveness uh, requirement using behavior programming. So every, we said that every box must reach a target location infinitely often. And we used uh, deep reinforcement learning for learning a strategy uh, regarding when to uh, apply each action. So um, this is the, the idea of high level uh, modeling or programming. And I'm, I'm now, if there's no questions, I will move to the second topic or uh, research direction. So what did yeah. what, what did we uh, what was the application of AI in this uh, in this uh, example the project? So the application of AI is to find a path to find the the exact action that we should take. Uh, you, it replaces the funnel, okay? It, the, it replaces the funnel and says. Uh, and uh, is trained to, to find the, the good action, the action that will not lead us into a deadlock and will keep this requ liveness requirement uh, fulfilled all the time. So eventually we will be able also to win the game, but here the, the, the purpose of this uh, uh, programming is not to find an optimal solution or to find a solution at all. It's just to keep the all requirements uh, um, fulfilled. Okay. 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 So um, the next topic is how we use um, behavioral programming for uh, process mining. So this uh, work, uh, I. Well, all of you are probably aware of different techniques for, for converting text to code. Uh, for example, uh, uh, GitHub Copilot, um, you, you enter some text and then you get um, you get uh, code completion or even uh, complete code for, for what, you, uh, you, what you did. And, and most of the work uh, you are probably aware of uh, uses big data and, and translation NLP tools for transforming and translating text into code. But my focus here in this big picture is, is on the right, how can we take um, execution logs and create a program, a, a code that generates the same execution logs. And this can be used for process mining and, and, and many other, many other uh, tasks. But the reason we want to generate the code and not, for example, a neural network that a, a lot of the, the many, much work on, on process mining using neural networks, deep learning, and, and process mining using uh, by extracting an automata and so on. But the reason for, for generating code is that con code is expandable. You can take a look at the code and understand what the code uh, does. And what are the functions, what, it, what each function is responsible of. So if we can take execution logs and generate code, source code from these uh, logs, it means a lot. And, and uh, this is the work uh, uh, done by, by one of my students, Roy. Um, and what Roy did, he created a framework for generating behavioral programs using system logs. And the user provides system log. Um, and a function for ranking each log uh, trace, each uh, uh, row in the log. 
So for example, given uh, logs of the game of tic-tac-toe, the function ranks the performance of the old player. And from these logs, the system extracted the possible events, X and O for each cell. It also extracted and, and, and automatically uh, um, deduced the, the possible um, context. For, for example, there's a cell, there's a line, there is a fork uh, if you want to win. And so it, it deduced uh, structures in the data, in the events, in the domain, and used this, uh, and, and given these structures that it extracted automatically, it also generated the behavior for each um, uh, for each um, uh, structure. So for example, uh, it generated the wait for two cells, two X, and then place an O to block the X from winning and so on. Um, so uh, given this uh, execution log and a ranking function, the, the, the system generated uh, using evolutionary algorithm, it generated a random population, a random uh, population of programs, of behavioral programs, that is combined with many random uh, behavioral threads. And over evolution, these B threads um, evolved more and more until they uh, uh, were able to play all, almost optimal. And, and, and the interesting thing is that these behavioral programs were actually very similar to how we programmer play uh, tic-tac-toe optimal. So they were a bit different instead of waiting for two X and then placing an O, it waited for one X for, for each two cells uh, on the same row, on the same line. It waited for two and for one and placed the, the O instead of waiting for two X and playing O. So it, it generated a different program and yet it was very similar to how we think and, um, and generated something that is uh, uh, self-explainable. And you might say that this is a toy problem, but this is not true because this is the first time that uh, evolution or, or any AI method was done at this uh, magnitude to create source code uh, from scratch, which is modular with more than one or two functions and, and also explainable. Um, so this is just the first step in the world. We, we, we are now extending this work to, to support different type of domains, not only games, or not only uh, um, board games and so on. So, so there's much more to do to allow it uh, to, to make it truly generalized. But the concept, the the, the algorithm was unaware uh, of the domain. It, it was not aware that this is tic tac toe or something like that. It just received logs. So it's, it's a generalized method. Though there's much more to do to make it truly uh, able to handle any uh, domain or many domains. Do we have time for a question? Yeah, I think so. Uh, I think a key component, what you, it's very cool what you showed, but a key component here is that you see actually all the expected law. Yeah. You, uh, I, I did not hear the, the end of the sentence. I'm sorry. Okay. So your genetic algorithm will, de will uh, develop the logic on. Adil? We're still losing it. Yeah, your internet connection is not stable. So you have the, the takeaway uh, at the beginning of the lecture. I think I have a, I mean, if I'm guessing where your question is going, I think I have a similar question, right? So here your genetic code, uh, your process mining is basically going through the entire, you're, you're actually running the entire automation and you're going through every possible, uh, you're going through the uh, logs of every possible action, right? Many possible actions, yeah. Um, it's genetic algorithm, it, it heuristically searches space. But... Mm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so, so complete your question, Sanita. I think you were, you're going to say in, in cases when you don't have logs for certain yeah, exactly. parts of the system, exactly. right? Oh, what do you That's do, exactly. right? Yeah. Because so, often we may not have all the parts, we may not have the entire working, right? Right, 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 right. right. So, um, as a matter of fact, Roy uh, did two versions, one learning from the log and also one uh, uh, he, he created a function that just um, run the system 
and and estimate if the player uh, played well. So it's it, it runs the system uh, one thousand times, I think, um, and and give a, and rank the output uh, after each run. So it can be either um, running on logs and see if you are able to um, uh, reproduce the the same behavior, or it can also um, create random programs, run it, run them uh, a thousand times, and 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 then evaluate them based on this. Would it, uh, would it be actually looking, I mean, is there another option that it's actually looking at the logs and then based on that generating other actions that can go into the automation? Um, I'm, I'm not sure I'm following the question. I think that. So one is it looks at the logs and then, <clears throat> right? And, and based on that, it's actually um, deriving and defining the entire process. Okay, the other would be to look at it the other way and say, well, since I, <laughs> sorry, I may not always have all the actions and they may not be, you know, a, a complete coverage that I have from the automation that's running. So in such a situation, would it also be able to look at the logs and fill gaps in terms of other? Oh, oh, oh I see, I see. Mm -hmm. um, that's, that's a very interesting question. Um, actually, we, would, uh, we thought about it uh, that we might want to add some, uh, um, um, parameterized events that we don't know their name, just x1, x2, x3, and, and so on. And mm -hmm. if they help, um, they, they do not appear in the log, there are hidden events or stuff like that. But if they help uh, in, in, in a, um, creating a smaller uh, program, for synthesizing uh, a smaller program that, that, that uh, still uh, creates the same log, for example, then I would say that probably there are these hidden events that we don't know them, we don't have them, but they are probably there because with them, we get a, a more accurate uh, uh, model. So I, I hope it answered the question. Um, so yeah, not always we have these events. I believe we did, it, we did, not, uh, we did not try it, but I do believe that uh, it is possible. So, yeah, it's I think that might be an interesting space to go in. Yeah, so, so I, have a, I have a slightly different variant a suggestion on this, which is any complex system you're running is going to have lots of components. And some of them may be you know, producing logs and some of them may not be producing logs. And, and also different levels of components, right? Some of them are higher levels, some of them are low levels. So my belief, at least, otherwise you'll be getting something for nothing, you need to have some understanding of the actual system in order to figure out specifically what code you would write based on what the execution is. You cannot do it in the completely blind. So this may be another case for neurosymbolic kind of a thing where you need to bring in yeah. this, an understanding of the system along with the uh, execution traces to be able to say, oh, oh oops, we forgot to put a, uh, you know, a, a log yeah. here. Right, so I believe in order for this to work in real life, you need to have some description of the system independent of the execution traces to be able to definitely. map what's happening to the architecture. Without it, you'll be just- Definitely, definitely. So, 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 so I did not tell, I did not say all the, 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 the details, but yeah, in the paper we're talking about it and we have uh, actually what Roy did is he had a um, part of the definition of the system that plays uh, tic-tac-toe correctly or only the, the rules for tic-tac-toe and the evolution was not aware of this part but it, uh, it it took it as a as a as a given and given the logs it tried to to um optimize the program so that it will play optimally uh at tic-tac-toe but it was aware and uh, at, at some um uh, uh during execution it was aware uh uh, about the this uh, domain expert knowledge on on tic tac toe, so 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 yeah, I agree. Mm -hmm. And we also talk about uh, some kind of a methodology that we need to, to do. So so in complex system, you want to start with some domain expert knowledge and then tune it using uh, uh, this uh, tool, and then you get a you get some uh, advanced version of your program, and then you want to refine it a bit more because you look at it and, and it. Looks a bit different, and, and you are aware that 
you should you should have changed something here. So and if you just change this one, it will be, work better and so on. So it can be a uh, 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 ping pong, you know, between all these uh, between domain knowledge and and automated uh, tools. Okay. And also, uh, actually, I have I have uh, something uh, at at the end of the of this presentation about about testing, which is I think uh, kind of uh, related to to what you talked about. So uh, with your permission, I, I want to go on and and. If we'll have some time, so uh, I'll be able to answer more questions. Um, so another approach um, we are looking into is uh, how we have our programming can be used to guide uh, learning process, in this case, uh, reinforcement learning. <laughs> and by that, I mean that we wrap the environment using behavioral program that can do uh, two things. It can either augment or change the features, and it can also dynamically change the reward function. And the advantages of that is that you get a, a better accuracy and you have robustness to, to edge cases, and you can, you can use a, a small or, or also non-representative uh, data sets because you have, uh, um, Integrated domain expert knowledge into the uh, to, uh, to, into the the learning process, and also the agility of the model allows for fast and, and simple changing of the features and the re reward uh, functions. So so you can adapt and change your 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 uh, learning either online or offline according to to what you see and what you you uh, experience with your data. So here's another example. Um, um, in this case, we participated in a conference competition for creating uh, controllers for robots that play soccer. And, and Tom, which you saw all earlier, another work uh, of Tom, so he wrote only four basic behaviors that generally describes how you play soccer, you, you move towards the ball, you spin to the ball, and, and so on. So only four behaviors, behavior threats, right? And in addition, uh, he was able to successfully train a soccer player using deep reinforcement learning that took the uh, following input. It took the, the pixels and the simulator information and the state of the bit threads and so on. And, and, and this um, uh, and, and the learning process was able to um, to learn a soccer player uh, uh, for this test. And, and the result was that um, uh, it was not only able to, to, to play, it was able to utilize this uh, information and converge it into a solution. And another problem with AI, which is a bit similar to the, to, to the previous one, is that some, sometimes AI does uh, stupid things. And it can be even critical in life-saving systems like autonomous vehicles. And, and usually this is dealt using uh, override rules. So the kind of a rule of thumb that says that uh, something like if the network output is uh, X and we are currently in a context of Y, then I ignore X and output Z. And the problem with uh, rules that they are not scalable. I mean, what happens if you have 50 rules? Are there uh, any contradictions between them? Is the order important and so on? And, and the guy you see here, Guy Katz, is our uh, colleague from uh, uh, Hebrew University. And, and his solution is to guard the network by guarding, by wrapping the, uh, the agent after learning, or actually I think also during learning, but uh, wrapping it using behavioral, a behavioral model. And, and the clear advantage is, is that you have a, a, a model that keep the agent from doing uh, mistakes. And the model is agile. You can add more scenarios and more scenarios without worrying about its correctness. And the reason that you don't need to be worried about the correctness is that behavioral programming um, has a wonderful uh, characteristic that you can verify the correctness. It, it's, a, it's a mathematical model that you can ver verify its correctness. So you can go uh, use uh, formal methods or, or um, um, any verification techniques or, or tools that we already have for behavioral programming to check if the model is still correct after adding more and more scenarios. And there are other advantages, like um, instead of using stateless rules, you can also define 
context aware scenarios like don't do B after three A's and, and, and so on. And you can also remember, you can also render override rules that are more comprehensible to humans while keeping the, the sufficient while keeping them sufficiently powerful and expressive to increase the, the overall safety of the model. Um, and almost last um, um, research direction. So uh, in, in, in this, in the next few slides, I will show you how we use um, this synergy between AI and behavioral programming for explaining uh, human actions or human players' actions. So for example, we are interested in explaining in real time why a player made an, a certain move. And our, I would say, ambition uh, is that we will be able to give explanations like, although the player could take the free, uh, take a free opponent's uh, pawn, the player gave it up in favor of taking a bishop in, in three moves. So this is kind of explanations that, that explains uh, the, the human player actions in real time in the language of human players. So it's not a features explanation, it's, it's a, it's a um, domain language explanation, explanation in the domain language. And in this case, we have a domain expert in chess with uh, uh, Benny. And, and for me, he's an expert player, but he would say that he's just average. <laughs> and, and this is a, a in-progress research, but we already have some great uh, results. So what Benny did, he, he defined different strategies in, in chess. And each strategy is defined as a separate scenario. So for example, he took the, the playbook of chess and, and there's a rule that says, uh, during the openings, you need to strengthen the, the center to, to do moves that strengthen, strengthen the center, or you need to develop uh, pieces and, and there are different strategies. And he took each strategy and defined it as a separate behavioral thread. And in the next step, he created a data set of thousands of games from uh, chess.com and he deliberately chose a uh, game games that are uh, of average players, because uh, average players are, tend to, to play by the hook. <laughs> they're not beginners that do whatever they want, and they're not um, uh, experts that do things that we do not understand. So we wanted to, to stick to the playbook. And uh, for features, what, 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 uh, what he did, he took each, each uh, um, um, each uh, line at, in the data set is uh, represent a, a possible state, a possible action in the game. So for example, currently there are eight possible actions of pawns and there are uh, other possible uh, actions of the horse and, and so on. Um, and, and each row is labeled whether um, a human player did this action or did not. And the features, are not the pixels or the state of the game. The features are the state of each behavioral thread. So currently all behavioral threads are at their beginning position, but uh, during the game, the, the behavior that uh, strengthened center uh, did uh, four moves out of uh, eight and other bithread did uh, six moves out of, out of uh, uh, seven and so on. So these are the features. And, and after we have this uh, data set, we tried uh, to train the funnel. We tried to train which action a, a, a human player would actually do. And, and this step already yielded amazing results. The prediction accuracy was 86%, while the current state of the art that uses deep learning and, 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 and big machines is only 53%. So, so this is a huge jump. Uh, uh, in the accuracy. And, but this is not our goal. Our goal is to, to, to explain the human action. So given this uh, calibrated uh, program, calibrated uh, funnel, we used it to explain human action. So how we did it? So we used the uh, explainers like, the same principles of explainers like SHAP. So SHAP, uh, if you don't know, SHAP is a, is a method for understanding uh, uh, which features influence the model uh, decision. So it performs, uh, SHARP performs an analysis 
of the impact of features on the result and explains which feature had a positive impact, which one has a negative impact, which one has a neutral impact and so on. And also we can specify the magnitude of the influence. So given SHAP and given these um, uh, features, we use SHAP to, expl to explain why, um, uh, why the model uh, uh, chose uh, this action and not that action. And SHAP says, okay, this feature is positively uh, influencing uh, the decision and this one uh, uh, negatively influencing the decision and so on. But these features are not pixels. They are not where each piece is. These features are processes. These features, each feature represents uh, the, the, how the player uh, thinks about uh, um, strengthening the, the center, how the player thinks about uh, um, taking the queen and, and so on. So, um, if you think about it, uh, this way we create a model that knows not only knows how to explain human movements, we also achieved it using uh, without labeled information. So this is kind of an unsupervised learning. We use supervised learning for predicting what human action, what human would do, but we don't have labeled data set on why are they doing it. And yet we are able to, to say that. Um, and, and while this uh, research is able to explain human actions, this is actually, uh, this method, the same method can be used for, uh, this theoretically, we did not uh, check it yet, but it, it can be used for explaining AI in general. So we just need your features to include, include domain expert knowledge as scenarios, as processes, and you can uh, translate these processes that are written in a, in how, in, in a way that is similar to how domain experts think about the system. You take them as features and explain your system using these uh, features. So, so this is a, uh, there's a gap here. Okay, I, I'm not. Uh, we did not test it yet, but but um, it's the same, the same principles. Um, at least theoretically, should work here as well. Um, okay, so this is the last research uh, I want to present um, uh, in this presentation. And in fact, Ishayao presented this research in our last meeting, meeting uh, a month ago. So I'm not going to go uh, into details. And I just want to connect it to what uh, uh, you saw today. So take a look at this uh, oxymoron that you're all familiar with. So a, a software bug is an unanticipated behavior. And a test is a behavior that we suspect that may be problematic. And, and so to detect the bug, we need to write a test. And, and this contradiction, this oxymoron, uh, um, was uh, several solutions were uh, uh, approaches were um, have been tested over the years uh, and try to tackle this this problem. So AI, for, AI, for example, have been used to generate uh, to automatically generate uh, certain types of tests like a uh, UI tests. But AI does not know the desired behavior of the system, and therefore, generally speaking, it cannot generate acceptance tests. For example, and and model based testing uh, tools like uh, FMBT are aware of the desired behavior and they were uh, designed to to handle this um, this problem however it is not feasible to maintain a large model of the of the entire system so you have a huge model fmbt model for example of the system but now some requirement change and the entire model changes you don't know where to change or how to change it and our approach emerged from indeed from model-based testing, but instead of uh, um, instead of specifying the model as an automata, we specified as a behavioral program. So here, for example, we used it to test uh, Moodle uh, learning sites. We wrote some three simple uh, uh, behavioral threads for testing. So there's a B thread that says how admin adds a course, he needs to log in and then add a course, and a teacher can uh, log in and then add quiz and then add questions. So this method adds quiz to existing uh, uh, courses and so on. And given these behavioral threads, of course, each, each action you see here, add a quiz, login, and so on, each of these actions have many 
uh, steps inside of it. So to, to perform a login, you need to start a new session. You need to go into the text box that says username and, and, and put in the username and the password and then click the login. So there are several actions for each of these steps and we can uh, connect these steps to uh, Selenium, for example, to actu actuate the, 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 the website so we can actually test Moodle using this approach. And, and but the cool things the cool thing here is that given these behaviors, different behaviors or different aspects of behaviors, we can uh, we, we, we are able to combine them and create all possible paths or all possible execution paths for testing Moodle. So each path that starts from the beginning and terminates here or here in this case, uh, each of these paths is a possible execution of this uh, simple model. So there are many possibilities. And given uh, these possibilities, we need to only to choose what to do at any given time. So from these ideas, uh, Gera and I founded uh, Provengo, a company that provides software quality uh, solutions. And also um, this was the, uh, I think the, the example that drove us to, 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 to write the paper with the, that Ishayao presented the last, in, in our last meeting. And it's also a joint work with Eitan Oded and Gera, uh, who are also here. Um, and, and the idea of this paper is that, and, and I'm, I'm, this is the last uh, slide, is that you specify the test model, how, how the user may interact with the system. You specify it using behavioral programming, and then you can specify coverage criteria that says uh, what you are looking for. You're looking, so there are many, many options here. You can say, okay, I'm, I'm doing nightly. I just want to test new modules or, or in weekends, I want to do integration tests between different modules. So you can define different coverage criteria and, and Shaya sh showed it uh, in the last meeting. And then using evolutionary algorithm, we are able to generate a test suites that uh, cover these uh, criteria. And, and, and finally, we have some uh, Bayesian uh, based risk analysis to, to improve this test suite on the fly um, whenever we see a new uh, failure or success, we can improve our test suite and, and, and change it and adapt it uh, according to food action. So my, <laughs> a lot of uh, uh, different uh, things, I hope it was clear enough. And uh, thank you for listening. And if you have any more questions, uh, we have a few more minutes. Um, thank you, Achia. Yeah, very interesting uh, lecture. Um, this takes me actually to, to uh, so, so you were, initially you were suggesting that you would refer to, at least in part of the presentation, to what a software or system should not do and how it, uh, it, would, it should affect the, the programming or the behavior. And, and when you say, actually, I cite don't do B, but uh, after three times A, that's a simple rule of don't do something, which is okay, that's perfect. But it takes me, uh, you know, many years in the, back in the history of AI where we were referring to the frame problem. And, and here I, I think, you know, the frame problem is actually saying, you know, you can tell me what about the part of the world that you know, but you, you don't know so much about the rest of the world. So how can you say don't do something if you don't know what's in the rest of the world? So of course, if you are not certain about specific behaviors, don't add behavioral threats for that. So uh, you do know that you must not cross the, the, the road if you did not look first uh, left, right, and then left again, and you are certain that there's no car. So only then you can cross the, the road. So you, the, the, there is a do not do or, or anti scenario here, which is clear. But if you are not certain that this is an anti scenario, don't add a rule for that and give, for example, uh, deep learning uh, to, to, to define uh, the optimal uh, choice. So, so you use a pragmatic approach where you, you re refer to observations or, or whatever you know about. Yeah, okay. But if, even if it's partial knowledge of the world. Yeah. Okay. That's it. And actually, you, you reminded me something that I wanted to say, and I forgot that. Uh, the ability to say what must not happen 
is mm -hmm. actually we believe we, we do not uh, we are working on it uh, right now, but we believe that it may be very helpful in process mining. So if the pattern is something did not happen, then process mining uh, uh, paradigms or approaches that tries to find patterns, and and if the pattern is what that something did not happen, and they are only able to find patterns that did happen, then they won't be able to create a small uh, uh, model of of the of the process. Yeah, but that's interesting, right? Because today that's, that's an idea. Yeah, we know we did not check it yet, but we are working on it. Yeah. So that's interesting, right? Because today process mining tools look at what what has happened, and based on that, look to actually articulating that process so that you can either optimize or um, you know do whatever else with the process, right? So I think one thing that you know, as a potential extension here is to be able to, you know, from, from what you're doing is to look at the logs, uh, see what the process is doing, right, which is what you can do, and then look based on what is what the process is doing, define what tests will actually test that process, because then you can use that to be able to generate or identify what the process should not be doing. Sure. I agree. I mean, th this is, uh, these things are uh, we are working on these uh, approaches and we're thinking about them. I agree. Yeah. So, uh, this 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 uh, field is called active learning. You can actively learn by 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 querying. Yeah, we we also do that. And and, and on I I want to add on 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 to to add an answer to your question too, please. Uh, I think you know when when you're testing a system, for example, I, I'm I'm testing a model, for example, the model side. Of course, I don't know all the details of the implementation, and I don't want. <laughs> oh, we lost you again. I want to know, but I need to Once again. We lost you, Gera. Uh, okay. Again. Do Do you hear me now? Yeah. So I said that that when you test a system like model, you want to have a partial model of, of the system. You don't know all the, the implementation details, of course, but having a partial, you know that you cannot, for example, add a question to a test that you didn't create. You know that you cannot do stuff before some other stuff. And this is what you specify. It's only a partial specification of what you can do, what you cannot do. And then uh, having this partial specification allows you to, to be, be flexible. That's the point. I mean, to generate many tests that are um, possible in, in, in using this specification and not only the tests that you thought about uh, initially. We actually found some uh, bugs in there. Yeah. I think, you know, we are just about to, to finish the, the, the whole hour and, and it was a very interesting lecture. Maybe it's time to say that in a, about a, in five weeks, actually, the, the, nine, the January 9th, because we don't want to take the day after the New Year day. So uh, January 9th will be our, our next meeting. And we'll, of course, send a reminder as we did this time. And uh, I wish you uh, happy holidays and a happy new year. And uh, let's meet again in five weeks. Thank you. This was excellent. Thank you. Cheers. Yeah, indeed. Thank you Thank very you much. much. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, Achia. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye.